two bits of technology in my hands. I will do my absolute best. Especially since I'm going to be talking about technology. That's quite embarrassing if I get this wrong. So, the Schumacher contradiction. So, uh, this is uh, someone modelling a piece of uh, jewellery, which you might be able to see uh, there is in the shape of a dinosaur. Um, it is actually, I am told, a Parasaurolophus. Apologies for any paleontologists in the audience about my poor pronunciation. Uh, this uh, product is produced by a company called Designosaur. Um, and Designosaur is a small online uh, jewellery boutique uh, specialising in uh, dinosaur-shaped jewellery. It's founded by these two young uh, entrepreneurs, that's Carly Dendy and her boyfriend uh, Jacques Keo. Uh, and Carly, uh, after she graduated, was working at two jobs uh, to pay the rent on their flat in Brighton. Uh, two minimum wage jobs, working in a uh, behind the counter in a small jewellery shop and also working uh, as a waitress uh, in a Japanese restaurant. Uh, she was trained as a designer, as was her boyfriend. They set up Designer Saw online, and within about two to three years of launching Designer Saw, Carly was able to leave those two jobs and become full time uh, designer for her own company, <coughs> doing something uh, she absolutely loves designing jewelry and selling jewelry. Now, the reason she was able to do that was because of this company, which many of you may have heard of. It's a company called Etsy, which is an online marketplace for people selling arts and crafts products. It's enormously successful. It now has a million sellers uh, registered with it online. Um, and recently, some of you may know, had um, an enormous, uh, very successful first share offering on the NASDAQ stock market uh, in the States. The importance of Etsy for people like Carly and Jack is that they're able to set up their business basically almost entirely costless. They don't have to spend anything on marketing because Etsy allows them to reach out to a global marketplace literally millions and millions of potential customers across the world uh, for free. Because Carly and Jack just wait for the demand from customers to come in, they can make their products to order. They don't have to build up lots of stock, borrow, borrow money from a bank to create that stock and then hope that it sells when they set, uh, put it through wholesalers into shops. They simply wait for customers' requests to come in and then make on uh, demand. So what Etsy and the internet has done has allowed small businesses to set themselves up to reach out to a marketplace in a way that they couldn't have imagined of doing five years, ten years ago. Business cost a lot more in those days. So this is a huge step forward for small entrepreneurs. And we can see that over just the last 15 years or so, the number of small businesses in the UK in this case has risen enormously compared to the size of other businesses. So the blue line are businesses with zero to nine employees. The rest of these are businesses with between 10 to over 250 employees. And you can see that while most other businesses have remained largely static, a bit of uplift in the last couple of years as the economy has improved, small businesses have kept on rising enormously since 2000. In fact, this trend goes back a lot further, really to the early 1970s. In about early 1970s, there were about 800,000 small businesses in the UK. Now there's around about uh, 5 million. So this has been uh, a real shift. Now, of course, there are many causes for that. 
But there's absolutely no doubt that the internet has been one of the big drivers of this. It's reduced costs for small businesses and entrepreneurs so significantly that it's much easier to set up a business now uh, and make it successful. And like Carly, allow you to do something uh, that you love rather than uh, working uh, for someone else. And this gives you a sense of the enormous growth in internet use that goes um, alongside that. If you look at the yellow line here, this is the, pop the world's population, the proportion of the world's population using the internet. So back in 1995, a few years after the internet was launched, it was 0.4% using the internet of the global population. 2009, these, these figures go up to over um, a quarter of the world's population now using the internet. An extraordinarily speedy adoption of uh, this technology, which has transformed uh, business. And the people we have to thank for that are these people. This is the Homebrew Computer Club, meeting in probably in around 1975 uh, in uh, San Francisco. This was a group of hobbyists who got together with one aim in mind, which was to destroy IBM. <laughs> These were student radicals, many of them, radicalised during the 1960s in the peace movement uh, and the various revolutionary movements of the 1960s, who detested big business, big corporations, they weren't great fans of big government either, and they wanted to create a different type of computing, a different type of technology which was at human scale. They detested the way IBM and similar corporations had created, turned computing into this enormously expensive technology which was only available to the biggest corporations and the military and government. They wanted computing to be something that everyone could access. So it was in organizations like the Homebrew Computer Club, which was probably the most successful of the hobbyist groups there were in San Francisco at this time, in the Bay Area of California, um, that started creating the personal computer. And out of this computer club came Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, who then went on, of course, to found Apple um, and created the first really usable, affordable home computer in the late 1970s. And many people forget that that origin of that personal computing revolution really was rooted in that radical politics, that dislike of the big corporate domination of uh, the economy. And of course, it was that personal computing revolution, which then developed so rapidly in the 1980s, that ultimately allowed the internet to be established and create that incredibly transformational technology. So this, of course, is E.F. Schumacher, looking very pleased with himself, <laughs> as well he might, because he was completely right in the 1970s when he wrote Small is Beautiful, when he argued that small-scale technology needed to be created to challenge the way corporations and governments had created in the 20th century an enormously expensive, enormously complex, large-scale technology which denied people the right to use technology to set up their own small businesses, to make work meaningful, to be fully creative individuals. Now, he wasn't entirely right, because he believed that the place where this new technology would be developed, of course, would be in the developing world. And that's where he placed a lot of his, the final years of his life, campaigning very hard for the developing world not to adopt the mass production technologies which he felt had caused so many problems uh, in the advanced economies. He didn't know at the time, 
that there was this new small-scale, human-scale technology being developed in uh, California. Although I'm almost certain, although I've struggled to find examples of this, but it'd be interesting if anyone has any examples out there, that the people in the Homebrew Computer Club almost certainly knew of E.F. Schumacher and would have been inspired by his ideas because Schumacher, Small is Beautiful, was incredibly popular in the United States uh, in the 1970s. So I'd be amazed if the people around the Homebrew Computer Club hadn't been inspired by Schumacher's ideas. So he was right over this technological change. He was maybe wrong about where it would come from. But this is a revolution that is far from over. This technology is now moving into whole new areas. Many of you will have, of course, heard about 3D printing, a new small-scale technology which could be operated at human level and allow people to manufacture their own products and commodities. So the technology is now beginning to move out of just being about information, which of course where the internet has been focused and moving in to manufacturing. And we're already seeing the price of 3D printing machinery and falling very rapidly and the quality rising very rapidly. So I think it will not be long at all before people begin to purchase 3D printing uh, machines uh, for their own use at home. The Internet of Things, which many of you may have heard of, the connection between different machines uh, and different objects, is also going to revolutionise this world of manufacturing um, and interaction between real world, beyond information, uh, in ways which we've yet to foresee. Many people expect, for example, that the Internet of Things is biggest revolutionary change within the world of energy giving individual consumers and communities and families much greater control over the production of their own energy and how their energy is used. It would be a huge transformation, potentially, of one sector which is still, of course, very heavily dominated by very centralised, hierarchical, large uh, corporations. And then finally, this incredibly boring-looking slide is something called uh, the blockchain. Um, I won't go into detail about it. Some of you uh, may have heard of it. But suffice it to say, it's a piece of uh, it's an approach to software development developed around Bitcoin, which is an online currency, which has an enormous potential to uh, transform and accelerate peer-to-peer -peer relations uh, online. So we know that, for example, the way that the internet has transformed peer-to-peer -peer relations. So, for example, we have things like uh, crowdfunding, uh, YouTube, social media, where people are able to communicate with each other individually and collectively uh, far more effectively than they could five to ten years ago. Blockchain will allow people to have peer-to-peer -peer relationships in all sorts of areas, such as financial transactions, uh, contracts, because essentially it allows people to trust each other online far more than they can uh, currently. So the potential for blockchain, for example, to completely undermine banking is enormous. This is something that's been acknowledged by the Bank of England. They have said quite openly that blockchain will absolutely revolutionise uh, the financial services sector because our ability to start um, trading, uh, having financial transactions with each other without having to rely on a bank is that much greater because of blockchain, because we can now trust uh, each other when we do those transactions. So this is hugely beneficial. This is a real change in the way the world works. That small-scale technology has really transformed the world in the way that uh, Schumacher hoped. But here's the contradiction. We have human-scale technology unleashing creativity, allowing people to live much more autonomous working lives and small business, just as uh, Schumacher predicted. And yet here's the paradox. Economic power has simultaneously become more concentrated and large-scale at the same time. 
We can see this just by looking at just you know three relatively random statistics. We look at wealth, the ownership of assets. 0.1% of US households now own 22% of the value of all assets in the States. That's grown from just 7% in the early 1970s. If we look at income, the top 10% of male earners in the UK have seen weekly earnings double from £500 per week in the early 70s to over £1,000 by 2008 while the poorest have seen a rise only from £200 to around £300. A market share. The top 500 global corporations earn a third of all business revenues in the world. That's up from a fifth in the 1960s. Now Schumacher, of course, was writing about the dominance of big corporations in the 1960s and early 70s, and he was struck at the time by how powerful those corporations were and wanted them to be undermined. And yet all that has happened since the time of E.F. Schumacher is those corporations have actually enhanced their hold on global uh, wealth, income uh, and business. So that means what's happened with the technolo technological revolution that Schumacher mm. predicted is that it's given us the tools to be fully creative, autonomous individuals that have satisfaction in our work and are self-determined, as Schumacher wanted, but bizarrely, not the resources to use them fully, because those resources are increasingly controlled by a smaller number of businesses and a smaller number of people. This has enormous risks. I think. The first risk is triviality. We have these tools, but because the resources to use them fully are not available, the money, the assets, we end up using them for increasingly trivial purposes. So, you know, it's great for gaming, for example. YouTube is marvellous for putting up, you know, film of kittens falling off chairs. <laughs> Twitter is great for talking about you know, what a, how marvellous the weather is and what a great day you've had. But the real potential to use this incredibly transformational technology that Schumacher wanted, to use it to live really fulfilled, creative lives that transforms work, which was so important, and that makes work a truly creative, self-determined endeavor is overlooked. And that takes us to thwarted potential. The potential we now have with this technology, like Carly, to actually turn our dreams into reality, to put creativity at the heart of our lives and our working lives, <coughs> begins to be prevented because the assets simply aren't there. So I'm always struck by the fact that in the UK, as I said, there are around about 5 million businesses. 50% of the GDP of the UK is controlled by 6,000 businesses. The other 50% is controlled by the other 4.9 something million. That's a ridiculous share of GDP. It shows how powerful large corporations are and how little there is to go around the remaining businesses run much more along the lines that Schumacher uh, was hoping for. And then finally, I think, is the potential uh, for conflict over the longer term. Because we know from history that when you raise the expectations of people about what they can do with their lives, give them the technology, the opportunity to make themselves better off, to live fully rounded creative lives, but deny them the resources to do that or keep an elite in power, the ultimate result is conflict. It's what we saw in the, for example, around the time of the English Civil War, where a new merchant class 
began to gain confidence and gain wealth and activity around the businesses they were setting up, but were thwarted in achieving their full potential by the power of uh, the monarchy, which ultimately, of course, led to violent conflict, which was replicated across much of uh, the rest of uh, Europe. So there's a real risk here that people become more and more dissatisfied, more and more frustrated uh, with the state of the world. So what do we do about it? Well, there's many things we can do about it, but I've just got three uh, suggestions. I think the first is to think really hard about the structure of corporations and companies. And this goes back to something Schumacher himself was very keen on. He was a very strong proponent of employee ownership and of mutualism. And I think the reason he believed in that, well, a number of reasons, but I think one of the reasons was because under the current structure of corporate ownership, all the wealth flows to the small elite who invest in the company. We have this underlying assumption in the way companies are structured that somehow the assets of a company and the value that flows from them belongs only to the people who have made the investment in the company or started the company up. As though workers have no role in enhancing the value of an asset. If you go and work for a company and work for it for 30 years and the assets of that company grow, its assets might be, you know, for example, its database these days, an enormously valuable asset. You as an employee have made an enormous contribution to enhancing the value of that asset. But your ability to realize the value of that asset is nil in law. It belongs entirely to the person who started that business, owns the shares, or invested it to begin with. Employee ownership and mutualism changes that relationship by saying that when wealth grows, it needs to be shared out more evenly across uh, the company. Now, I would go further than that and say, actually, these days, consumers themselves are enhancing the wealth and value of individual companies. Companies rely enormously on consumers to increase the value of their companies. It's not, it's not the old days, back when you know, Schumacher was looking at mass production, when companies produced a product and sold it to consumers, then bought it and took the fridge home and used it at home. These days, companies like YouTube, for example, or Twitter, are completely reliant on the creativity, the activity of their customers to give that company some sort of value. So in fact, I would go further than Schumacher and talk about how consumers can begin to gain some of the value from the growing wealth of corporations and companies. In fact, Britain has a great tradition of consumer mutuals, of course. And I think that's something we should uh, revisit. Then there's home ownership. And antitrust. Two of the things which actually prevented the huge rise in the power of corporations in the 20th century getting completely out of control were two trends of the 20th century. One was the expansion of home ownership, which was an enormous drag on inequality, the rise of inequality in the 20th century. Because homes, home ownership expanded so much in the 20th century, the assets and wealth of the country were spread much more widely and distributed much more widely than they might otherwise have been. And that really continued for 50 to 60 years uh, for most of the 20th century up until the late 90s and then into the noughties, where home ownership has actually begun to reverse and shrink. So the property, some of the most valuable assets of the whole country are now beginning to be owned by a smaller group of people than was the case during the 20th century. And I think that is an enormous, should be an enormous concern to us when we look at the way uh, inequality has grown and the concentration of economic uh, power over the last few years that I identified earlier. And then finally there's antitrust, or the moves in the states in particular to prevent large companies dominating too much of the economy. 
This was another big trend in the 20th century, particularly in America, where there was huge opposition to the rise of the large-scale corporation. There was opposition to the way large businesses were beginning to dominate large parts of the economy, and very aggressive antitrust, anti-monopoly, and anti-oligopoly legislation uh, was put in place. That has been weakened enormously in the last 40 years. If you want to know why corporations and now more, have more and more power over the American economy and the global economy, one of the major causes is the fact that the antitrust legislation was weakened in the 1980s by Ronald Reagan. An interesting feature of that early antitrust legislation is it wasn't just about consumers. It wasn't just about our consumers getting a good deal, which is something we think about with competition policy now. It was actually about the distribution of wealth and assets and inequality. There was enormous fear in the states in particular that these large corporations which create a, create a new aristocracy of the super rich who would dominate politics, dominate the economy and dominate society. So monopoly had to be undermined in order to enhance uh, equality. That's completely been lost. I think we need a new movement, like we had in the early 20th century in the States, to challenge big corporations and say, actually, it's the job of government to make sure that big corporations do not dominate large sectors of the economy, and that domination needs to be challenged on the basis of whether it's enhancing, increasing inequality, not just on the basis of whether customers get uh, a good deal. Now, there are many other things that can be done to address this Schumacher contradiction, to allow us really to take advantage of this new human scale technology that has uh, been created over the last 20 or 30 years. Um, but those are just three ideas that I think and hope that E.F. Schumacher himself uh, would embrace were he alive today. Thanks very much. <laughs>